Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. We're about to enter our praise time, and it's one of my favorites. Um, worshiping God is always a rich blessing in itself, but when you're with others, um, I find it even more of a blessing. For example, um, exactly a week ago, I was at the Calvary Church in the afternoon with um, Karen, and Florida Hospital, or Adventist Health Systems, was celebrating their anniversary over 100 150 year anniversary. So they threw a big praise concert. Um, and then afterwards, um, Karen and I went to uh, Florida Hospital's Ginsburg Tower, all the way to the top floor. I think it's, they have 14th floors, 14 floors. Um, but out of that experience was honestly one of my favorite because um, it was a transplant, or no, I'm sorry. Was it a transplant? No, it's not. But anyway. It was a lot of patients that had, happened to have a lot of cancer. But what we do in hospital ministry is we go into patients' rooms, we sing to them, <clears throat> pardon my voice, and we share a Bible verse and pray with them. And whether it is praising God in our own solitude in our homes, whether we are praising Him in the hospital with strangers that we just met, or whether we are in a church, um, I just thoroughly enjoy praising God. Amen? Amen? And it's a great privilege that we even have a church that we can do. I mean, we take it for granted, but um, some places, they don't have this great privilege. So um, join with me in prayer as we um, begin to praise God. Almighty God, you are author of life. We are in awe of your creation. The vast oceans reflect your majesty the ever-changing skies renew our lands. The deep valleys carry your peace and shelter. You are savior of the world. We are amazed at your grace. The nations find peace in your forgiveness. The sufferer hope in your healing hands. The burden rests in your promise of heaven. You are unconditional love. We are privileged to be fulfilled by your presence. The youth are filled with your vision. The old are filled with your wisdom. The oppressed are unchained by your freedom. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Spirit, we worship you. As you say in First Peter, we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that we should show forth the praises for God who has called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Well, good morning, church. On behalf of the young adult of Officer Church, we just want to welcome you and have you stand up. And we're going to go ahead and start praising his name this morning. And we're going to go ahead and start with our first song. It's called, You Are Holy. So go ahead and enjoy this. Praise his name and worship. Here we go. Go ahead and lift up your voices, praise God, sing with all your might, give glory to Him, because today is His day. Here we go. You are holy. You are holy. You are worthy. You are mighty. You are worthy. You are worthy. Worthy. Worthy of praise, and I will follow. I will follow. I will listen. I will listen. I will love you. I will love you all of my days. All of my days, and you I will are sing Lord to Him. You are King of Kings. The you are King God. of God. It is worthy, and I will love you. And I will bow down before him, and I will sing to and worship the King who is worthy. And I will Alpha, Omega, beginning and end. And I will bow down before him, your perfect peace. And I will live my life for you. You are holy. You are mighty. You are 
that all the church talks about is two things, money, and in our church, potluck. It's true. Um, it's every week, we do give our members an opportunity to participate in these ministries, right? This is activities that everybody can do. If you can't sing, if you can't preach, um, everyone can pray, everyone can give their offering, and everyone can participate in potluck, right? It got me thinking, you know, how many hospitals out there are sponsored by various churches? Of course, the Adventists are known for our health message and our hospitals. Um, same with some Baptist churches, Presbyterian ch churches. But there are no hospitals for the atheists. You don't see, you know, Orlando Atheist Hospital. No. Christians back in the day started these hospitals because they believed in something. They believed that people needed physical healing. The same for our Adventist family. They believed in their health message and that's something that we carry on to this day. Now, although we do have a lot of medical professionals in our church, Orlando Filipino Hospital is not gonna happen. <laughs> Maybe in the future, but not right now. I want to assure you that your gifts that you use today are gonna to be for the good causes, a hospital for hearts. Our church is a hospital for hearts. The tithes are, of course, given to the conference, that's allotted for them, but our church operating expenses will stay right here in our church. The operating expenses, in case you all didn't know, include things such as the water, the plumbing, air conditioning, beautiful landscaping, the AV equipment, maintenance of our building. You know, we need a new permit for our beautiful building over there, which we haven't even set foot in. What are we doing with these gifts that God has given us? We have this beautiful space. We need to maintain it and repair it. And that can be given through the giving of your tithes and offerings. If you have your offering um, and tithe envelopes, they should be there in the pews. I wanted to bring to your attention underneath tithe and love offerings. The tithe, of course, is 10% of your income. Notice we do have options for the local church budget. Church budget, the building fund, which we have a building, let's keep funding it. Other can be to other ministries that you designate, and so on going down the line. Every gift, no matter how big or how small, matters, and it will be used directly in our church today, and you can make an investment into the future for our own church. Can I invite the deacons to please stand? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you're the provider of everything. You're the owner of everything in this world. We praise you because we have a space, we have a place, Help us to reach those around us. Help us to reach out and be hospital to the hearts of 
those in our family and in our community. I pray that you will bless this offering, bless where it goes, the hearts that it touches. We praise your name. Amen. There's a land that is free. Where's the. I thought he put the lyrics in there. is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar, for the Father waits over the way, to prepare us a dwelling place there, in the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. We shall sing on that beautiful shore. The melodious songs of the blessed, and our spirit shall sorrow no more. Not a sigh for the blessing of rest In the sweet by and by We shall meet on that beautiful shore In the sweet by and by We shall meet on that beautiful shore In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. We shall meet on that beautiful shore. nothing worth more that could ever come close no thing can compare you're our living hope your presence Lord I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome here come 
this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living home. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen. Of the sweetest of loves When my heart becomes free And my shame is undone Your presence, Lord Holy Spirit, you are welcome place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Oh, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. It was yesterday morning. It started off as a pretty calm day, and then the day went on. After work, my manager, an employee of mine, the facility manager, comes up to me and tells me, September 23, remember that. Puzzled, I just look at her. Then with sympathy, she looks back at me. Knowing that I was defeated that day, that I was beaten that day, she goes, September 23, remember that day, because next year it's probably going to be terrible again. It's probably going to be another big problematic day. So remember that day and be ready for it. I left the facility and drove home. Part of my drive was in silence. I just 
thought about what she said, be ready for a problematic day. I sat in silence, in meditation, and in prayer. And I looked back and I was like, you know what? She was totally right. That day was terrible. Anything that could wrong in an assisted living facility went wrong that day. It, was, it felt like I was fighting fires upon fires upon fires upon fires. And I was so tired. And I look up and there were more fires. I just wanted to go home and quit everything. I still sat in silence, meditated, and prayed. And then God spoke to me through Isaiah. He said, fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, because Maha, I am your God. I will strengthen thee. I will help thee. I will uphold thee with my righteous right hand. When I heard that, I realized, God, I need you in all things that I do. In every aspect of my life, when it's busy, I need to just spend time, take that moment, and get you involved with what I'm doing. Church family, I know a lot of us have the heavy laden, the burdens in our heart. I invite you to come up and pray with me as we do the Garden of Prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this beautiful Sabbath day you've given us, Father God. Lord God, we humbly bow before thee because we know that you are the God who spoke and everything came into existence and life happened. Father, Lord, we ask that your presence and your power be with us so that life will happen within us as well. Father God, we come before you with different things in our hearts, Father. Some of us come in because we are so happy. We are filled with joy, O oh God, because of your mercy and your love for us. You've blessed us throughout this week in our lives. You've given us the things that we've asked for and your promises, Father, they came true because your words and your promises, Father God, are real and you do not lie. But some of us, Father, we come in here with heavy hearts, with heavy minds, Father. Lord, we come to you because there's things in our lives that we don't understand what's going on. There's things in our life that just doesn't make sense. And Lord, you're the, only, you're the only answer. You're the only reason for it. So we bow before you with our problems. We bow before you with our burdens, whether it's financial, physical, health problems, emotional or anything it may be whether it's family friends father lord we give it up to you because we're tired father god we just want rest and you promise us to come to you with all these things we cast all your cares upon you father god you will give us peace lord i continue to pray that you be with this church be with the pastor as he breaks down the bread of life let it be that you fill us with your spirit let it be that we come out here praising your name, lifting your name on high because, Father God, this is what you do to us. You fill us with your spirit and we come out shining for your glory. Thank you for hearing and answering this question, our, all our prayers. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Praise. 
to save us. To save Amen. Today's scripture reading is found in Isaiah chapter 49, verses 8 to 10. This is what the Lord says In the time of my favor, I will answer you, and in the day of salvation, I will help you. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant of, for the people to restore the land and to reassign its desolate inheritance, to say to the captives, come out, and to those in darkness, be free. They will feed beside the roads and find pasture on every barren hill. They will neither hunger nor thirst, nor will the desert heat or the sun beat upon them. Good morning, church. How are you? Amen. I was very excited this morning. Very nervous, but very excited. And uh, from, from what I've heard, we haven't done this in, in, in a while. And uh, I was very excited that we were finally going to be able to do it, that, uh, that our young adults would, um, and our youth would have a chance to minister to our church. And uh, actually, it, it was a combination of all ages that uh, contributed to this. Uh, right, Pastor? I mean, how, how old are you? Like, right? All ages. I'm, just, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, and uh, we just had a lot of fun doing it. Uh, I want to really thank... Uh, the, the youth band who, uh, who came out and participated with us, who led us into worship. Um, uh, I think I got your names down. I want to thank uh, Seth, who was on the acoustic guitar. I want to thank JR, who was uh, singing uh, along uh, with Mariah. And I want to thank uh, Jeremy for playing the uh, electric guitar and the other Jeremy for playing the violin guitar. Um, I wanna, <laughs> I'm just kidding. And I want to thank... Uh, Jarrell for being on the percussion, and I really, really want to thank um, uh, Kevin Rizon for having the time to organize this, to organize this worship for us, uh, to really lead us into the presence of God this morning. Um, I had a lot of fun. I enjoyed um, all these worship uh, songs, and, and I hope you sang uh, out loud. I did, and um, I was blessed. Um, when I first got here, I hung out with Mahal one day, and that one day he was listening to this news broadcast station. As he was listening, listening to his news broadcast uh, station, I was genuinely interested. And I was like, oh, what is this about? You know, this sounds very intellectual. And, you know, I'm, I'm all for uh, trying to figure out news on my radio station. Yes, 90.7 NPR News. And this is Mahal's fault. I got hooked on this news station. And... Uh, yeah, if you guys want to talk about anything, even, you know, whatever, I think I have the, the smarts to it now because I've been listening to it, like, every day. Um, nonetheless, this news station really talks about a series of things. And in these series of things, uh, there's, like, uh, military coups, and, and it talks about uh, uh, different uh, national news, news and international news, world news, um, local news. And what is fascinating is that in a world with so much more to offer, we have so much more crime. And we have so much more debt. And we have so much uh, more uh, dispute over small, simple ideas. 
Like, who's going to be president? Which one is the least worst of the bad that we have? That's what our choices have come down to. What is not as bad as everything else? And it hurts that in, 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 this, in this city, in Orlando, where, where, where shootings have occurred, and, and in our nation, uh, the great United States of America, where uh, we have street shootings, and we have school shootings, and we have business shootings, and people die every day because of confusion. And at times, I have, to, I have to switch. I have to go to 88.3 or 7. Uh, you know, it brings some joy into my life. Because it seems like every news is bad news. And it seems like every information that we receive is either not positive, very negative, or has a glimpse of hope in it. Um, amongst all this sadness and all this trouble that surrounds our church and surrounds our, our city of Orlando, we still serve a God who has chosen, I believe, to put a beacon of light in Altamont Springs. Who has chosen, who has a plan for this church to progress, to move forward, to bring peace to those who cannot find it. I believe God has mighty things, mighty wonders to work amongst this congregation. You don't sound convinced this morning, church. You don't sound convinced this morning. Among all these tribulations and among all these difficulties and trials, among the world being so appealing, distractions being so constant, how great it is that we serve a God who sits on high, who is in control. So in figuring out how to better serve our community and trying to uh, better serve the young people of our church, we, I want to say we, I think it was uh, uh, Vince and his team, I, I was just sort of uh, informed on it. Our youth, they have vision. And they decided to come up with a ministry, which is really a, a revitalizing an old ministry. How many of you have heard of AY? Yeah, what does that stand for? Yeah, something like that. So they came up with Gala. Now you may be wondering, and I know a lot of you are wondering, because if they, po they posed the question earlier, what is Gala? And give me one second on the video. Give me one second. And before we begin today's message, and as we were uh, presented before the throne of God in praise and worship, let us receive instruction from that throne this morning. Let us receive bread. Let us break bread. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you because you have gathered us here today. We thank you because your spirit prompted us to come here. We thank you because, Lord, you inspire us. We thank you because you motivate us to go out and preach the good news, to go out and tell the captives to go free. Because... You point us in the directions of those who are in darkness and show them the light. Lord, let us show them the Prince of Peace. Father God, let us show them Jesus. As we are going to uh, receive instruction this morning, as we're going to read your scripture, God, please teach us. Teach us not only to be... Um, emotional and, 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 and to love you with just emotion, but teach us to love you and our neighbor with action. God, we want to better serve you. Teach us how. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I do want to share this video with you guys, and, and, and Vince is the, the sole maker of this video, and, and if you guys could play it now, um, and maybe turn off some of the lights. Awesome.
So I remember going to Vince's house, and we sat there, and I ate some mango, right? I think that's what it was. And, um, and we were sitting there, and we're like, all right, what are we going to do? Like, what's, you know? So we started brainstorming. We started thinking of different ideas, and, and Vince was like, oh, you know, we've got to rename this. And I was like, yeah, we do. Obviously, Agua is not that capturing. Um, so, so they started um, saying, okay, focus. You know, I think that you know, we really want our youth to, to focus, to focus on Jesus. You know, we, we are very distracted and all these things and, and, and blah, 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 et cetera. And uh, we said, all right. Um, and we said, oh, let's see a, a Greek word in the New Testament. You know, and we'll, maybe it's something nice. You know, people have done it before. It's pretty sweet. So we looked at the Greek uh, words, and the Greek words just kept on getting longer and longer and longer and longer, and we would have had to use the board horizontally, and it was just, it was too long. No one was going to catch up, catch on to it. So we're like, all right, let's go to the Hebrew. So we went to the Hebrew, and we found this word that we liked. And this morning, I'm, my sermon is based on this word that we liked. And this word, um, originally... Our mindset, you know, when we were into it, and we were like all happy and everything, and, and, and we saw this word, and, and then I had to go and do a word study on it, and I, it just happened to be that the word says more than what was presented on the video. It says more than what we thought it would mean. See, it's very important, church, that whenever it is that we grab a verse from Scripture, whenever it is that we do study Scripture, whenever it is, parents, listen, I'm not a parent, but I'm a son, listen, if you tell your child that this is the way we're going to do it because we've always done it, he's not going to want to do it. Did you hear that? He's not going to want to do it, or she's not going to want to do it. The, the explanation of this is the way it's always been doesn't satisfy us. Does not satisfy us. You want to instruct your child, and the scripture says, instruct your child, and uh, after he goes away, he'll, he'll come back, and we all hold on to that verse. So let me tell you, that verse is talking about instruction at home, and not saying we're going to do this at home because it's always been this way, but doing this at home because there's reason, there's biblical proof that this is the way it should be done. Parents, read your scripture. We must learn in order to teach, and we must teach to teach. So I'm looking at the, sorry, and parentheses. So looking at the, the context of the word, we found that, or I found that there's two different uh, definitions, general definitions. But in those definitions, you're going to find um, different meanings, if that makes sense. And the two main definitions that are there is one, to uncover. And we saw that one in the video, to uncover. Now, to uncover could mean one or two things. It can be a shameful act to uncover oneself. Or um, when God says, I will uncover Edom because they uh, attacked my children without cause and tried to take their place. And uh, you can read that um, in like the book of Kings. And, and you'll see that uncover sometimes is something that's shameful. But when the word applies to God, that God uncovers something, is that God reveals something to a person or a people about himself. And that's the one that we really want to hold on to, right, Vince? That's, that's the definition we really like. Um, God uncovers or reveals something. And now the other definition that I found interesting that we, we didn't come across is... Um, to be exiled. To uncover God reveals something about himself, but it also means to be exiled, depending on the context in which you're reading it. And it was interesting because, well, the, the, their thought process is, well, yeah, if the land is, is, is revealed or the land is left naked, what happens is that there are no inhabitants. Thenceforth, there was some sort of exile or some sort of migration. And... Um, this term really became popular to be used as exile after um, these different kingdoms like Assyria and Babylon started to, um, to take conquest of, of Jerusalem, of Judea, of the northern kingdom, of the other 
uh, ten tribes. And um, you see that this word becomes a little bit more popular in Old Testament history, where the people of God are being exiled. And it's very interesting also that this word, usually the subject of this word, is the people of God. It's never like, oh, the heathens are being exiled, or, oh, you know, that guy who sinned is being exiled, or whatever. No, it's mostly, largely, almost always, speaking of the people of God. That's a little weird. People of God always being exiled. What about the bad guys? What's interesting is that in both cases in these... um, in these words, it, it, it depicts motion. Motion on behalf of God. And you see, you see that in the stories of the exiles. And you see that in, um, in Chronicles and in Kings when um, these kings of Israel and of Judea are overthrown and taken captives. That the subject of exile is almost always God's people. To take them into exile. In case you didn't know, the exilic period or, or that moment in, in history is, uh, is very particular. And you see that first, you know, the, the northern kingdom. And, and w- when you read uh, Chronicles and you read Kings, you're going to see that the northern kingdom is, is ten tribes of, of Israel, while the southern kingdom is Judah and Benjamin. And... Uh, what you're going to see is that the northern kingdom gets taken um, already by the, Assyrian, uh, by the Assyrian Empire. And when they come in, they take them and they, they get scattered and they basically get lost. Okay, so they're lost. And now a century and a few years more later, Judah and Benjamin, the southern kingdom get taken over by Babylon. And I want to emphasize this because I want to talk to you about someone. And that someone has to do with the children's story this morning. See, when they took all these people captives, they took this man and his friend, and this man is called what? Daniel. And when they took Daniel, it said, oh, you know, only take this certain kind of people. And can someone describe Daniel for me? Well, give me some descriptions of Daniel. He was young, intelligent, brave. You guys are stealing answers from the kids, man. Faithful. Yeah, he he prayed a lot. He was duty-bound. Yes, he was handsome. Yeah, he was a good-looking guy, man. He was very good-looking. See, the king wasn't, you know, wasn't dumb. He was like, listen, I don't even want good things in my palace. So if he doesn't look good, he can have all the smarts. But if he doesn't look good, don't bring him in here. So he wanted the best of the best. The best of the best. Kind of like Kevin over there, you know? You see that handsome young man? Yeah. Something like that. Daniel could have looked like him, maybe. So uh, take notes, ladies. Uh, you can ask for his phone number on the way out. Anyway, what you see here is that they conquest and they take these people out and they exile them into Babylon. And the exile trip wasn't all that great. You know, it wasn't, you know, all right, a caravan, you know, you get on your, in your van, your rental, and you drive all the way over there. It was nothing like that. It was basically you were walking naked for a good amount of time. It didn't take, you know, five minutes to get to Babylon. It was like all the way on the other side of, you know, what they knew as, as, as the world then. And it was a rough walk. There were stones and rocks and, and, and you slipped and you fell and you were all like tied up together. So if this guy fell, you fell. So they would always be arguing, bro, stop falling, man. You're making me eat dirt. And they wondered, how is it that God's people are going through this? This makes no sense. You chose us and now we are going into exile. You have to look at the reason behind it. And the reason is that, first off, the northern kingdom just completely, uh, you know, broke the covenant with God, was unfaithful, started worshiping 
um, other images, other idols, and Judah soon followed. What we see here is the most traumatic time in the nation's history. And if you want to know more about it, you can read uh, Psalms 137. It kind of describes of something of somewhat what they were feeling, what they were going through. See, God was sending them into exile, into the nations where the gods that they idolatrized with, or committed idolatry with, I'm not going to make up words this morning, committed idolatry with, see, those gods were supposedly in charge over there. So God was like, okay, you guys want to go? Go ahead. And they didn't do so well. They didn't do so well. And on the, on the way there and, and, and when they first get there and, and as they're being treated or trained or whatever, it wasn't like home. And home would never be like home again. See, Daniel, with all these good qualities, there's a specific title that is given to him. And I want to get into that this morning. If you go with me to Daniel, the book of Daniel, chapter 2. Book of Daniel, chapter 2. Now we all know the story of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and we all know that um, Nebuchadnezzar got so upset that he was like, hey, you know, kill all these guys because they're, they're no good. They can't tell me what my dream means. Are you there with me? Verse 24. Verse 24 and 25 says, Therefore Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me before the king, and I will tell the king the interpretations. Then he quickly brought Daniel before the king and said thus to him, I have found, (laughs) that's funny, Um, anyway, people are always going to try to take credit, sorry guys, I have found a man of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretations. I have found a man of the captives of Judah, a man of the sons of captivity is the literal translation, a man of the sons of Galah. This man will interpret your dreams. The son of cap- one of the sons of captivity. And it kind of, it's kind of like a derogatory term, right? Like, oh, the son of one of those guys we defeated, you know, <laughs> losers. He's going to try to interpret your dream. Now, it happens multiple times. Daniel chapter 5, verse 13. Just turn a couple pages with me. Daniel chapter 5, verse 13 says, Are you there, family? Verse 13, 1 3. Daniel chapter 5, verse 13. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. And this is when, if you read the little title at the beginning of your chapter, you see that the hand of God writes on the wall. And um, after this, you know, the king freaks out and he calls Daniel, and Daniel shows up. Then Daniel was brought in before the king, and the king spoke and said to Daniel, Are you that Daniel who is one of the captives from Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah? Are you that Daniel who is one of the sons of captivity? Are you that Daniel that is one of the sons of Gala? Chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 13. We know this story very well, the lion's den. So they answered and said before the king, these all those guys are trying to accuse Daniel of doing things wrong, right? So they answered and said before the king, that Daniel, who is one of the captives of Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, For the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Huh. King, that guy, 
from the sons of captivity, that guy of the sons of Gala, isn't following your decree. He's still praying three times a day, and he's not praying to your image. We can tell you that right now. See, yes, Daniel was a devout man. He was a strong man, strong in the faith. See, it's funny because Daniel's faithfulness would get him into trouble, but the only thing that would get him out of trouble was his faith. Hmm. That's weird. That's odd, right? His faithfulness would get him into trouble, but his faith would get him out. See, many times we're quick to say, God, I was faithful. What's the matter with you? Why am I going through this? This makes no sense. If I knew I was going to go through this, I wouldn't have done all that stuff for you. I mean, it served no purpose. Where is your faith? Where is my faith? Daniel was duty-bound with his whole heart into it to God. He was exemplary, an agent of peace among an idolatrous nation, among a nation uh, of Gentiles, among a nation who did not worship God, who did not follow God, who did not care for God. He was an agent of peace, a beacon of peace. I imagine what kept Daniel going, you know, were some principles that he may have picked up from God, that he may have picked up from these messages, so many letters written to the captives in Babylon. And we can go there right now in Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 29. See, I imagine these messages kept Daniel going, these promises made him uh, going. And, and this morning I want to ask you, family, what makes you keep going? What gets you going? What gets you fired up? What keeps you motivated? What keeps the fire kindling inside of you? Is it the promises of God? Or is it the good things that happen to you? What's interesting is that we tend to say, oh, you know, it was easy for Daniel. It was easy for Daniel because, you know, Daniel, you know, God revealed himself to Daniel. So, of course, Daniel's going to believe. Of course, Daniel's going to have faith. Of course, Daniel's going to follow Jesus to the death. Of course, he's going to keep praying three times. I mean, God revealed himself to him. I would do that too. God, I would do that. I mean, if you revealed yourself to me, I would, I would do what Daniel did. But we don't feel like he does. We don't feel like God reveals himself to us. You may be thinking that this morning. God, reveal yourself to me. Why don't you just reveal yourself to me like you did in the olden times? How come Moses got to see you? And we argue with God. And we argue with our pastor. Yeah, but pastor, it's not, it's not the same. You know, back then to now, it's not the same. I mean, we, yeah, we have a book, but, you know, they had God. This morning, I want to tell you, you're wrong, and I can't wait to prove you wrong. In a couple of minutes, you just wait for it. It's really good. Um, amen. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 4 through 7 and 14. Oh, I'm not even there yet. Jeremiah chapter 29. Verse 4 through 7. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Listen, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused. This is God saying, Hey, I took you away. But I took you away with a purpose. Whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives and beget sons and daughters and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands so that they may bear sons and daughters that you may be increased there and not diminished. Even in their captivity. And seek the peace. Listen. Are you listening, family? Are you reading along? And seek the peace. Of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive. And pray to the Lord for it. 
for in its peace you will have peace. Yesterday I was playing FIFA. Yeah, I'm a soccer fan. I love Argentina. I love Messi. Let's get that out of the way. I was playing FIFA with my housemate, Juan. And Juan recently bought his Orlando City shirt. And he's all excited about his Orlando City shirt. And he's like, yo, yo, let's... <laughs> he's like, yo, yo, let's, let's play FIFA. Let's play a game of FIFA. I'm like, no, dude, I have to go uh, buy stuff to make pizza. Um, Quick side note, another one. Uh, we have this, um, this thing where we eat pizza every Friday night. Every Friday night is pizza night uh, in my family. So if you ever want pizza, you can just stop by my apartment. No charge. Free. As long as you let me know you're coming. If not, the pizza's going to be gone. Um, so he goes, he puts on his Orlando City, and he's like, yo, come on, just play a game with me. I was like, okay, I'll play a game with you. So we put it on, and, and uh, I was like some... Canadian team. I don't know MLS teams. Sorry. I was some Canadian team, and he picked Orlando City, and he wore his shirt and everything. He was like, yo, you know, Kaka, the star, man. He did score with Kaka, by the way, but I beat him in both games. And it, 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 the reason why I'm telling you this is because I thought about it. I'm like, do we pray for those people? Do we intercede for random people, saying, hey, God, I don't know what, I don't know what Kaka's going through. Do we intercede for them? Have we, when was the last time you prayed for your city? When was the last time we, you prayed for, I don't know, what do we have here, mayors? When was the last time we prayed for our city, family? Verse 14, I will be found by you, says God. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from the nations and from all places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to the place where which I have caused you to be carried away captive. Oh, God has a beautiful promise for everyone in captivity. You're going to be there but only for a while. You're going to be there only for a while. I will bring you back. But while you're there, you are to be a beacon of peace among those people. You are to reflect me in your city. You are to be an example. Careful. Lord, I don't want to be involved in ministry, you know. <laughs> uh, be careful. He'll make you go be involved in ministry. Because it'll save you. See, the best person to talk to your co-worker is not Pastor Dan. The best person to uh, go uh, speak to the guy at the gas station that you see every day is not the first elder. It's not Dr. Layson. The best person to talk to your wife may not necessarily be uh, marriage and, and counseling, a uh, family life ministry. It's you. We are so afraid. Daniel was exemplary. So how does this apply to me? What, what, what lesson am I getting here, Brian, from what you're, what you're reading here in Scripture, what it says here? How does this apply to me? That was a million years ago. Um, this makes no sense. Explain a little further. Let me explain to you something. If perhaps you got lost in the way, you, you didn't realize this, but you are in exile as well. No, I'm not. I was born and raised in Orlando. What are you talking about? Genesis 3 talks about the first exile. 
What happens in Genesis 3? Who's that about? Adam and Eve. Our forefathers. Way in the beginning. See, we are sons and daughters of an exile from a relationship, an intimate and perfect relationship with God. And though we lost that perfection, God is still willing to use us. See, they were still to have peace where they lived. They were still to work the land. They were still to take care of uh, the plants. They were still to do all these things. They were still to be beacons in the world that they lived in, the fallen world. They were promised a Savior. As they were promised a Savior, they were given a task of, of, of worshiping God and how they should worship God and, and where they would go to worship God. And, and where they would go to have this relationship with the Lord. See, in, in Scripture and throughout our lives, we see, um, like Daniel did, Daniel prayed three times a day, every day. How many of us forget to pray every day? Don't raise your hand. Don't do it. And we, we, we become disconnected from God and we have all these distractions and we forget our source of communication with Him through prayer. Now let me go back. It was easy for Daniel because, you know, God was revealed to him. And that's some of what we think, and, and it's okay. I'm not saying uh, you're wrong. I'm just telling you, let's read a little more. Let's go to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 40. This is a good chapter. Isaiah chapter 40. See, it was easy for Daniel to trust God. God revealed himself to Daniel. See, what's interesting about this word, gala, is that when it is attributed to God, it is He who is doing the uncovering of Himself to us, who is letting us receive something from Him that we had not experienced before. And we go there to Isaiah chapter 40, because this is, this is powerful, family. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 5. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 5. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And we read this verse and we're like, oh, it's so pretty. And it's such a nice verse. This is our problem. We think that there's a specific process for revelation. There's a specific process for revelation. See, if God doesn't appear to me physically, then He did not reveal Himself to me. If I don't hear God's voice, I don't even know what it sounds like, but if I don't hear God's voice, then He didn't reveal Himself to me. And we're so focused on the how. And we're so focused on the way that it has to happen. See, this verse actually is not speaking about God's literal voice. It's speaking about a process, a, a process in which you can see God's activity. See, it says, let's read here, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. You know, the mouth of the Lord, is the, he's the one who is saying this. But it is something that we can see when you trace history, when you look around you, when you see things happening, you can say the glory of the Lord is being revealed. You don't sound surprised this morning. Because perhaps to you and to me, all this time, I've seen all these things happen. And we've gone through all these different experiences. But we say, oh no, God hasn't revealed himself to us. He was there. He was there in what was going on. He was in control. But we have a hard time believing it because 
It didn't always benefit us what happened. What happened didn't always benefit us. Therefore, God did not reveal himself. His glory will be recognizable. See, speaking of this and taking it to Israel, Israelite's history, the glory of God will be rec- recognizable, will be visual when Israel would be delivered from the hand of bondage, when Israel would be delivered from a captivity, when Israel would be delivered from Gala, when Israel would be taken out from where they were supposed to be beacons of peace and brought back. See, somewhere along the lines, they forgot what their purpose was. God had to remind them. Somewhere along the line, we forget what our purpose is, and we feel like we have no purpose. And God is trying to remind you. And in that reminder, he's saying, God, you're being unfair. He's like, no, I'm just trying to get you along, man. Come on, this is what you're supposed to be doing. The glory would be recognizable in God's act of deliverance of Israel. The glory of the Lord will be recognizable in you, in God's activity of deliverance in your life. You know why the roof didn't blow off when everyone here said amen? Because we are resistant. Because when forgiveness is being talked about, we don't respond. Because we feel like we're okay. Like we don't need forgiveness because we come to church. Like we don't need deliverance. God, I give you all my time. I give you money. I give you tithes. I give you offering. I, I, I serve. I do everything. What are you? Deliverance. See, there's always that small little thing. God, I give you everything. But that. See, we, we grew up in a culture where what he or she doesn't know won't hurt them. There's a problem with that when we come into a relationship with God and it's that he knows everything. But we are so resistant, family. So resistant when the pastor, when Pastor Dan makes a calling for forgiveness, we're so resistant to come up here. And there's no special power about this place. There's nothing special about where I'm standing. But we act like there is. No, there's something that I have to fix first before I accept deliverance. And you know what? Some did not accept deliverance. When it was time to come back, they said, no, it's okay, peace, deuce, we're fine here. We can't go out and try to minister our city if we have not experienced its deliverance. We can't expect for them to see the glory of God in us when we don't accept deliverance, when we haven't accepted the forgiveness for that thing that constantly haunts us. And I know it does because it haunts me too. We are so hesitant. We are so hesitant to even listen this morning. God is earnestly seeking us. And we resist Him. He's there ringing the doorbell and we resist Him. He's there calling out our name and we resist Him. He's there knocking on the door. And we resist him. See, he's not waiting for an invitation. He's already there. You need to open the door. There's deliverance to be had this morning, family. 
but it's not going to happen if you don't let it. There's deliverance to be had from that pornography. There's deliverance to be had from that premarital sex. There's deliverance to be had from cheating on your wife or your husband. There's deliverance to be had. There's peace to be found in Jesus Christ. And we often resist it. There's something powerful here in their exilic experience. There's something powerful here in their exilic experience. There's something powerful here in their exilic experience. There's something powerful here in their experience of Gala. There's something powerful here in their experience of Gala. In Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 29 through 30. In Ezekiel chapter 18. For the first time in Israel's history of constant idolatry. Of constant idolatry. From the moment they left Egypt. At Mount Sinai when they were supposed to hear God's voice. Where they were supposed to receive the Ten Commandments which they did. They were so prone to failure, so prone to falling into false worship. But there was something powerful about this experience of Gala. See, for the first time, they realized, they recognized that they had angered God, that they had wronged the Lord. And when you read history and when you read about this word and when you read about the exilic experience, you will see that the word of God became everything to them. And they became so studious. They became so wise in it. And they memorized it. It was the only thing they had, see, because long gone were the temple and the, tra- and the drapings and, and, and the sacrificial system and everything that they had and held dear. The walls of Jerusalem were torn apart. The temple crumbled to the ground. There was nothing left but the Word of God. In this exilic experience, for the first time, they began to stop blaming their ancestors. They began to stop blaming their ancestors. And they, became, they began, sorry, to recognize that both salvation and sin was something very personal. We tend to, to speak a lot, oh, you know, salvation is, is personal. You know, if I choose to be saved and I accept and I'm saved, then that's great. But sin is very personal as well. You can't say, oh, you know, everybody sins. So, you know, if everybody messes up this question, the teachers tend to erase it from the test. That's not the way it works. And they began to study Scripture and they began to see things for what they were, and they stopped blaming their ancestors, and they started focusing and shifting their focus to the Word of God. And for the first time, they realized there was a necessity for repentance and individual accountability. And you see it in Jeremiah chapter 31 and Ezekiel chapter 18. Isaiah 49. This morning scripture reading, I promise I will end with this. Isaiah 49. See, this is such a powerful text, family. This is such a powerful text. See, Isaiah here is writing down what God is wanting to tell those who are in captivity. And he says, and he's speaking of someone who's going to come, who's going to do this. And this is a very messianic 
、uh, chapter of the Bible is very filled with symbolism of Christ and the servant and, and he who would be the light of the world, the beacon of hope, the beacon of peace to Orlando City, to the region of Altamont, to the church of Avsta. Read with me, chapter 49, verse 9 says that you may say to the prisoners, who's going to be saying this? That you may say, he's talking about Jesus, that you may say, he's talking about Jesus' ambassadors, you and me, that you may say to the prisoners, go forth. That you may say to those in darkness, come to light. This is the time, family. That amongst all this trivial things and all these things that are going on that to us is wrong, and that to us we know that this world is not slowly, swiftly decaying. It is time to acknowledge Christ. It is time to come to repentance. It is time to acknowledge that there is power in the Word of God and that power needs to be used. There is a time where we need to call out. It is a time for our church to become a beacon. It is a time for our youth to lead us into this new generation of telling our city, come forth. Telling our brothers and sisters, step into the light. He does not care in how much darkness you're in right now. He does not care about how much sin you may have committed this week. He does not care about how many times before you have ignored him. He cares about now. And now, family, I'm calling you to prayer. Now is the time of repentance. Now it's the time to come forth. Now is the time to come into the light. Please, family. Now is the time of action. Now is the time when we realize why it is that we are exiles. Now is the time that we realize what the purpose of God's law in our lives is currently. Now is the time that we realize. That we need to experience deliverance in order to show people who God is and God's glory. If you want to experience that deliverance,、oh, we're going to pray here together this morning. And as Mariah begins to sing, she's going to make a, a small pause. When she does, We're going to pray together. But as she is singing, you have the opportunity to come forth. And I'm not talking about, listen, church, I'm, I'm glad that you stand up. That's perfect. But that is comfortable. If you come forth for prayer this morning, you're going to be held accountable. And perhaps I may not remember two weeks from now that you came forth, but God will. If you want to experience deliverance this morning, this is the time. Now is the time. Understand the Gala in your life. What fortune lies beyond the stars? Those dazzling heights too fast to climb. I got so high to fall so far. But I found heaven as love swept low. My heart beating, my soul breathing. I found my life. When I laid it down, upward falling, spirit soaring, I 
touch the sky when my knees hit the ground. What treasure waits within your scars? This gift of freedom gold can't buy I bought the world and sold my heart You traded heaven to have me again My heart beating, my soul breathing Church family, when you see these occasions where Daniel's being a son of the exiles, when he's being called this, in each one of these occasions, he prays. In each one of these occasions, he seeks God. See, family, when we resist what happens is that we have to wait until we fall, until something trips us up and we fall, when falling is the only answer and it's the only time where we will pray. Don't wait for that moment. Choose to get on your knees. Don't act so far away that you're going to have to fall on them. God is present around us. God's active word, work around us is the revelation that he is here and he's revealing himself to us. Let us accept deliverance. Let us become a beacon of peace, hope, of forgiveness, of grace to the city of Orlando. Let us pray. Father God, Almighty God, Lord, we are so sorry. We have wronged you in more ways than we can imagine. We have ignored your words in more ways than we can come to know. We have taken for granted your sacrifice in more ways than we can say. We have taken your love for granted in more ways than we can explore. God, here are the exiles that you have placed in Orlando. God, hear us. God, look upon us, Lord. May your face shine upon us, God. Empower us through your Holy Spirit that we may go out, that we may seek those in darkness, that we may do your work, that we may spread the good news, Ah, that we may speak of peace in times of defeat, that we may speak of peace in times of war, that we may speak of peace in time of death, that we may speak of your revelation in times of so much disaster. God, look upon your youth. Lord, don't let them surrender but only to you. Don't let them fall, 
but only at your feet. God, bring us to our knees. Bring us to our knees, Jesus. Forgive us. Let us experience deliverance. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Thank you for worshiping with us. We pray that you're blessed. After this, we can go to the gymnasium because the good news today is we have potluck. <laughs> Amen. We won't have that next Sabbath though. <laughs> but that's not the reason for you not to come. Because we don't just worship just because we have food after. So, next Sabbath, we want to have the usual potluck. We want our hospitality team to have rest because it takes a lot. Instead of them enjoying the Sabbath rest, they are so busy. Let's give them some rest. So, tonight, you have to be here at 6 because there is... Another worship sponsored by our youth. In behalf of the church, we would like to thank the leadership of our young people, Pastor Brian, and the rest of the team. Thank you very much. And uh, we hope that you can come back tonight. Those who wish to spend time praying with the pastors will be here at the front. You can come and let's have prayer. Thank you and God bless.